Welcome to Let Your Light Shine, the podcast where we illuminate the path to your best self. I'm your host, John Fletcher on Louis Hartrick, and I'm so excited to have you join us on this journey of empowerment and self-discovery. Today and in each episode, we'll dive deep into the themes inspired by the book, Let Your Light Shine, Unleashing Your Inner Glow Through Essential Self-Care Practices for Empowered Women. This podcast is for anyone seeking to cultivate their inner glow, embrace their power, and truly let their light shine. In our conversations, we'll explore different topics that resonate with women and girls from all walks of life. We'll discuss the shine method, practical and transformative self-care practices like sleep, proper hydration, tuning into our intuition and nourishing our bodies while remaining fully engaged. But that's not all. We'll also delve into cultivating joy through hobbies, practicing grace, forgiveness, and engaging in activities that make our souls light up. Each episode features incredible women who share their stories, wisdoms, and insights They're entrepreneurs, creatives, professionals, mothers, daughters, all shining examples of how embracing these practices can lead to a fulfilled and empowered life. So whether you're looking to ignite a new spark in your life or fan the flames of an existing one, Let Your Light Shine is here to guide and inspire you. Remember for more resources and information, You can always visit lightshinebook.com. Let's get started and explore together how we can all let our light shine brighter. Join me, Jocelyn Jean-Louis Hardrick, in this empowering journey. Here's to letting our lights shine together. And now, let's dive in to today's episode. It's Jocelyn Hardrick back with another great episode of Let Your Light Shine, the podcast. Today, we're going to hear from Michelle Guzman, and she's going to tell us how she lets her light shine. Michelle is awesome. I met her as a law student. She was one of my students, and she's on the last part of her law school journey. She's very active in law school. She serves as a diversity and inclusion chair for the Student Bar Association. She's also the president of the Hispanic Organization of Legal Advocates. But before she even went to law school, Michelle had this wonderful career and a beautiful life. She's from Coamo, Puerto Rico, a little town in the southern part of Puerto Rico. And while she was there, she got her bachelor's degree in business administration, human resources management from the Pontifical Catholic University of Puerto Rico. While she was there, she got involved with Mu Alpha Phi Sorority. She also did an internship with Hispanic Association of College and Universities in Washington, D.C. And then she wanted to pursue a career in cybersecurity. So she got several jobs doing that. She joined the U.S. Air Force, where she got more experience in the field. And she also got her master's degree in cybersecurity technology. During her military service, she got a lot of skills, training, and experience that she found useful. But she had this dream of becoming an attorney. And so now she's about to do the last little bit of that to become an attorney, get her JD, take the bar exam, character of fitness. There's still some parts left, but she is on her journey to Esquire. While in law school, she's continued her spirit of service. She works with a debt relief clinic and she volunteers with the local legal aid organization to be a Spanish translator. And so we want to welcome Michelle Guzman. Hi, Michelle. Hello, Professor. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here on your podcast. I'm excited. Yeah, it's, we're excited to know more about you. <laughs> and so it's, it's, that law school journey is a tough one. It really tests your resolve and really make you decide who you really are, right? Yeah. And so that's where you are now. Let's go back a little bit because this is the Let Your Light Shine podcast. We want to shine a light on you and all your wonderful work. We want to thank you for your service. 
um, in the U.S. Air Force. And let's talk about why you wanted to be a lawyer, because you did all this great stuff with cybersecurity. But what's your interest in being a lawyer? I actually started uh, getting more interested in becoming a lawyer when I was doing my bachelor degree. When I uh, started my bachelor degree, I was 15 years old with no experience, no family in college, first generation. So I have no advice. So I start in a biology uh, a bachelor degree. And in my second year doing a bi biology, thinking that I'm going to med school, I was like, no, no, probably this is not for me. <laughs> I remember I went to an advisor. I, I talked to her about how I feel. And then she told me, Michelle, I think you will be a good in business administration. So get that shot in there. So I decided to change to business administration. And one of the first classes that I took was a business law. And I'm like, wow, I like this. I really want to know a little bit more about it. And during the time I was taking those required classes for a business administration, I was getting more interesting what the law, it work in a business area. So and at that point, I was like, no, I need to try to go into law school. When I finished uh, my bachelor degree, I did the LSAT. But I did it six times. <laughs> Because wow. my, <laughs> my scores were really low until the last two years when I was already in the Air Force, my English got improved. And I never took the Spanish LSAT because my plan was to move to the States to attend a school here in the States, not in Puerto Rico. Until I got a decent score. And I was able to go into law school. But yeah, it was a long journey. It was about 11 years that took me to get where I am you now. Okay, so I didn't know there was a Spanish LSAT. So the Spanish LSAT qualifies you to apply to only schools in Puerto Rico? Or how does that work? Yeah, it's correct. So if you take the Spanish LSAT, it will be the same component that we have in the normal LSAT. The only thing is... You just can't apply for three schools that they are in Puerto Rico. Okay. So you said you, your English improved once you joined the Air Force. So I'm assuming your undergraduate degree was completely in Spanish. Yes. In Spanish. Everything in Spanish. When I moved to the States, I was, so I was 19 years old, 20 years old. That I moved because I joined the service. And at that time, I was like, I'm here now. <laughs> it's on me. In Puerto Rico, you don't speak English. The only way is if you are in a, bi in a bilingual private school. It's a little bit tough because you're not practicing every day. So you get English classes in school, but if you're not practicing the language, it would be hard. Make it perfect. So. Yeah, so it's like the opposite of people here. Like everyone took Spanish in high school, but don't ask them to actually speak any Spanish. Oh, okay. So let's talk about Puerto Rico a little bit. So Coamo, tell us about that town, where it is, because I've never heard of Coamo. A lot of people part Puerto Rico. It's a popular right destination for Americans for vacation. I know a lot of Puerto Ricans growing up from New York, but this is my first time hearing about Coamo. So Coamo. It's a really small town. Everybody knows each other. I always give it reference, Ponce, because Ponce is really close to Guam. I went to college to Ponce because it's what is close for us. It, people know about Guam because they have the marathon. They call it San Blas Marathon. And people from all over the country, they go up for this space there. And they also have a water spring that people know about those water springs. So some tourists, they go to the area, but I'm more inclined to the mountain area. It's really small. It, 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 maybe it's like less than 20,000 people or maybe 10,000 people living in Guam. Yeah. Oh, wow. So when you uh, 
came to the U.S., you said you were about 1920. Did you come by yourself or were you here with other people? No, I actually, I came by myself. At that time, I have some family in the States too, but I was ready for this great journey and see how that goes. So I go into, I joined the Air Force as a reservist because my plan was to go into law school. So I was, I was not thinking to go as active duty until I was in the service and I got the opportunity to be a active reserve. And at that time, I did a little bit more time in the service, but we had always, my plan was to try to go into law school. So that was always my big goal in life. So that's amazing that you were able to learn English, take the, the LSAT in English. You're almost done with law school, learning a language really as an adult. You sound like you were really smart. You graduated, you're in college at 15. <laughs> so really smart. But that's fascinating to me because my parents both had to learn English as adults. And I was bilingual for a long time. And then, but I was born here and heard English in school all the time. What is it like for you to have to learn all this new stuff and be learning a whole new language? Because I know you're not the only one. Help us understand what that's like. I some sometimes it's overwhelming even yeah. now <laughs> because you got into those no opportunities, but I'll call it you got into those yeah, I would say opportunities in life that in making you frustrated to trying to express what you want to express. And you can because you don't find the words. Or even uh, you have over I, I have experience. Being a, a law student, I was in a moot court competition and I hear a judge telling me that you should stay in Florida because a lot of people are Hispanic and will be good for you. And I was like, because I'm, I do have accent, maybe. So it, it's really, it's really overwhelming. It's really challenging. I, I I need to be honest, like right now, currently I am in a speech therapy just to try to reduce my accent and make it better. I mean, I'm looking to make it better and be better as a person. And like you say, it's really a challenge to le learn a language being an adult because you, you don't get used to that. Like you need to be around people with the same language to be able to make it perfect. And that's why. When I saw myself trying to win the outside and nothing was working, I was like, no, I need to go to the state and be with people around me that make it better. I always read at night. I try to use any resource that I see around to make it better. It's really challenging. Let me tell you, it's really challenging. But yeah, it is. Yeah, I can tell from your voice and you're trying to express yourself now and it can be tough because and my parents have the same thing. So they just speak Creole. So if you ever need to speak, say it in Spanish, go ahead, girl, say it in Spanish. We'll figure it out. I know I can understand Spanish. I don't always speak it, but I understand that, that frustration. Like when I was a kid, I was speaking Creole and English. I didn't know that they were different languages. I'm just saying words that I know. And my teachers are like, what is this? But she said, it's like Spanglish, right? You just mix them all together. And in reality, it's really good that you're bilingual because people need you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, I'm not sure, let's say in a office and I'm seeing somebody who is just struggling, I need to help them because I know how that feels. I need to help them translate. I need to help them because they may feel frustrated at that point. In reality, I feel like we're more smart than other people who just make him speak to language. It's, I call it, it's a gift that we have. I call it a gift. It is. That's a good way to look at it. And then, but sometimes people want to put you in a box because of it. Because I remember my mom, she went and got her associate's degree in secretarial sciences. She could type. She, could, she was the fastest typist. She could do 
all the note tests. She did everything. She aced all the tests and no one would hire her because she had an accent. And her professor told her, it's a shame. Unfortunately, that's how it is, but you're awesome. You keep doing great things. And she went and worked at the post office because she had four kids. So like to that person who told you, maybe you should stay in Florida. I'm glad you shared that story because we need to share it and say, no, I don't. I can go wherever I want and do whatever I want and people will adjust to me. Right? There you go. So talk to us a little bit about what it was like being in the military. You're a young woman. You came here by yourself. You're learning English. You're doing cybersecurity, which is like such a new thing. We're still trying to figure out cybersecurity. What was that like for you? Like I said, I joined the military really young. So I was not even know what I was expecting. (laughs) Was challenging. Uh, My career field was in 3D. Uh, knowledge operation. I was in a communication squadron pumps at Air Force Base. During the time that I was there, they work with everything related with IT, information technology, from networking, security, records. But we were supporting the base. At some point, I was Helping the commander in everything admin and any admin tasks. I, jo- I traveled around. I was able to go into Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma for training. I went to Rheinstein for a couple months. And in the time that I was in Rheinstein, I was working with a great team over there. They were trying to change what is a physical server into a cloud and they were able to send me to different base. I visit Aviano Air Force Bay in Italy. I I really I really enjoy. I was able to know a lot of people. Met incredible mentors. They were able to provide me a lot of experience. It was a good time. I did. I joined 2013 until 2020. I did my time. And then after that, I was like, okay, now I'm ready. I took my LSAT in 2018 because I was preparing myself to finish my time in the service. And when I was, I did it and I got a good score. I was like, okay, this is the time now. Now this is the right time to go to law school the way that I wanted. So sometimes we want things in our way and they are, we don't get it in the way that we want it. But then we are asking ourselves, okay, now is the time. Now God decide, not when we decide. Yeah, it was great. I really like it. I really enjoy it. I learned a lot. I will do it one more time if I need to do it. It was a huge transition when I, I was done with be a civilian because you get used to it. You miss those people who are around you. You miss what you're doing. You miss that 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day. I really like it. Good. Oh, good that's first. good. You're the first person I heard to say, I do it again. Most people are like, no, I, I'm good. <laughs> like, I enjoyed it. I learned a lot, but I'm good. <laughs> But yeah, you said 2020 is when you left. And we all know 2020 was, you know, when COVID hit around March, April, everything was shutting down. So you must have been one of these people who started law school online. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I had my ETS was April 2020 in the middle of the pandemic. Even people from the military, they did not even know how to out process their members because Nobody were having any guidelines. So I applied to Cooley in 2019. I got into a, a program that they used to have for students, people they over 30, um, that they have a low LSAT or they take the LSAT multiple times like me. And then uh, I, I got into the program. I did my best. And then I proof that I really, I'm really ready to this new journey. And in 
May 2021 is when I start. But at that time, everything was still online. So it was a huge challenge for me because nobody knows how, how this online go. Even us as a student, professor, even the school, still, I, I was still adjusting about this new change. So it was really challenging because I was not expecting that. I was expecting to go to school. You <laughs> like a normal student, take some notes, see my professor. So I was, I was not ready. And by that time, I was living in Miami because that's where my base was. So I, I have my own place. I was living there for about eight years. So it was a really challenging for me to to experience the whole transition from military to civilian and now from civilian to lost. So it's a huge change every day. <laughs> yeah. And then it's just not, it's not, it's not just law student, it's law student online when you were used to learning in person. And a lot of people thought it was great. It was to some degree. Like I love going to my home office and teaching, but I realized all the students weren't getting it. It's easy to get distracted. Right. Yes, for me, I don't know if it's, it's a little bit weird, but for me, I really like it because I was like, I don't need to travel. I don't need to go outside. I don't need to drive to campus. I can do my classes and stay in my office, keeping working with my stuff. So for me, time management was correct because I don't need to have that commute or anything. I was having everything around me. And the only thing I was going out was to eat something or just met with my husband. That's it. And I was in my own comfort zone. For me, it was great. The whole change from online to in person, <laughs> that was challenging for me. That was really oh, challenging. Oh, wow. One more, ch- one more transition. So you're, are the, you are the queen of transitions. So we're going to talk about how you shine through all these transitions. So now you're in person, you're wrapping up law school and you mentioned your husband. So when did you be, go from single lady in the U.S. doing her thing to married lady trying to get her law degree? <laughs> yes. So we met in that 2020 crazy year. <laughs> so he know my whole transition about being in military and then join law school and the whole challenging being online and then he also moved with me to in person to, from Miami to Tampa so he should have a small piece of my degree and then <laughs> because he deserve it yeah because what happened was I did a whole year online as a law student so my first year my, my tough class was online but then they decide that, hey, COVID's not longer a threat for society. So we're going back in person. And I don't remember that term. I will never forget. I moved, I bought a house in Tampa. I moved myself during the holidays, 2022. I remember in Christmas, I was still packing up my stuff. And 20. That was 2021. Yeah. 2022, when the classes was about to start in January 2022, we received this email stating that, hey guys, club is still around. You guys are going back online. We will let you know when you guys are in person. I was screaming. I remember myself was screaming and crying because I did all of this to keep, to be online again. I would prefer to stay in Miami. It was a lot of pressure at that point. But my husband told me, Michelle, take it step by step. Don't worry about it. You're already here. At the end of the day, we need to walk. So we're already here. Don't worry about it. So I, he was right. I took it that way. <laughs> I took it to step by step. And then I start online again. Until uh, the middle of the semester, after midterm, they told us that we need to go in person. So that was another transition in there because at that point was 
different. Now I need to commute. I need to be in classroom. I need to know who was my colleagues and student that it would matter. That was more difficult because you could not even hear the professors really well. Really challenging. And even for finals, wow, now it's different. No blue book exam. Now it will be in a computer. So if that computer crashed in the middle of your exam, <laughs> you like your so yeah. challenging, but we made it. <laughs> That's all I was going to say. You made it because you're be close to the end. And you're still, the nice thing about being in person, you get to serve in these other ways because I saw postings that you're in the student government and advocating for students, especially students like you guys, because you all didn't get to connect with each other when we first started. So now is the time you get to connect. And it seems like you just always want to be serving. You're serving is a translator, which, like you said, really important. When you see somebody struggling and then they're having a legal issue and they can't communicate, it gets really tough. And language skills are one of the biggest things the legal profession is missing. A lot of lawyers can't speak multiple languages. And there's a lot of clients that we're not quite sure if they're getting their day in court, if they're getting the right representation because no one's translating for them on a regular basis. As we come to the close of another enlightening episode of Let Your Light Shine, I want to thank you sincerely for joining us today. It's been a true joy and privilege to share this space with you and our inspiring guest. Before we part ways, I'd like to leave you with a small nugget of wisdom to carry with you. Remember, the light you hold within is a beacon of hope, strength, and beauty. It's uniquely yours, and when you let it shine, you not only illuminate your own path, but also light the path of others. If you've been inspired by our conversation today, I encourage you to explore more at lightshinebook.com where you can find additional resources and support on your journey to unleashing your inner glow. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with someone who might also benefit from its message. Remember to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform so you never miss an episode of Let Your Light Shine. As we say goodbye for now, remember that every day is an opportunity to embrace your power, cultivate joy, and most importantly, let your light shine. Until next time, I'm Jocelyn Jean-Louis Hardrick, wishing you peace, love, and light. Thank you for listening and keep shining bright.